At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. At number 9, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Kamran, and chains his brother Askari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. At number 8, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? At number 7, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of Daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was only male heir left to inherit, so on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. At number 6, so to an ox. Now Jahangir was emperor, but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure, while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal, and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediments, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taksali Gate. 
Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. At number 5, the horse and his boy. On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, an interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There is a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shafavid Shah and it was travelling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. At number 4, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal. Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but we will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, whilst giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number 3, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. Control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. You would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. At number 2, Staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was kill Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zung. What made their deaths so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles, and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farooq Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. 
For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments, and historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non-Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Number 10. No one's ever really gone. You may have heard that said when losing a family member, a pet, or in the worst Star Wars movies ever made. Sorry, not sorry Disney, those are terrible. But perhaps there is someone who is never really gone. Kangas Khan, yes that's right, the ruthless Mongol warrior who conquered so much in his time that we're still talking about it today. So why is this big bad warrior still with us today? Well, that's because of DNA. Yeah, in his time there was uh, lots of activities going on, besides the usual pillaging the village and unaliving those who oppose you. There were a lot of happy endings, let's say, and by that I mean forced non-YouTube friendly conduct bedroom happy endings. So much so that when a study was conducted back in 2003, 8% of men in Asia were thought to be descendants of the mighty man himself. 0.5% worldwide. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about millions of people here. Next time you go out, you may be brushing shoulders with the warrior's kin. Prepare for battle! Number 9. Henry again? Boy, it's really hard not to talk about this guy. But dude was kinda down bad for it. He's just most well known for his mistreatment of his wives, and by mistreatment, I don't mean getting into a fight over whether or not the toilet seat should be up or down, and then having a very toxic argument in front of family members. No, because when Henry was upset with marriage, he wanted divorce, which honestly was kind of taboo for the time. Oh yeah, and he also beheaded two of his wives because... That's how it goes. I know every couple has their issues to work out, but for most dads out there, having sun-drenched beer-fueled weekends, they never go beheading after that. Although, dad's been staring at the lawnmower for a while and there's a lot of blades on that. I don't... Dad? While it is true King Henry VIII did behead two wives, he didn't do it to all of them. And at some points we're honestly quite pleased with his holy sanctity of marriage. Anyone who's ever been married can tell you how peaceful and sacred that bond really is. Number 8. The People's Princess Okay, I know Prince Charles isn't exactly a king, but he is royalty and the man kinda did Diana dirty. That's a quick and half put together allusion to a Michael Jackson song for the English majors and the audience. Being royalty isn't easy. Being royalty in a modern age when paparazzi overwhelm you with lights and cameras just for a juicy piece of gossip like, when was your last bowel movement? Is it slow? Extra extra, read all about it, the princess is constipated. That's just not fun. So after Prince Charles and Princess Diana had been married for a few years, you can understand how excited the media was to find out about their marital disputes. There was three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded, was a quote by Princess Diana that gave the media a field day. Sadly, Prince Charles was having an affair, and it wouldn't be too much longer that Diana would perish in a car accident that may or may not be organized by the royal family themselves. Number 7. Midlife Crisis This one's kinda generalized because if I didn't, I'd have to mention almost every king ever. So here we go. Back in ye olde times, the access to better healthcare just wasn't there. Doctors aren't washing hands. Imagine, buddy eats some greasy mutton and then says, alright, time for your enema. But those aren't the only greasy hands around certain orifices I'm talking about. I'm talking about kings marrying older girls at the ripe age of 12. Yep, that's right. Nothing says experience and womanhood like being 12. People didn't live long, and oftentimes these arranged marriages had ulterior motives, like alliances or business, really. However, that does not make up for marrying a 12 year old who may or may not have started those super weird changing times, like when you were 12 and now there's hair showing up in places that you didn't know there could be hair. I sent a courier to the chief. He came back with this message. It ain't it. Number six, till death do us part. Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, but sometimes the crooning words of Frank Sinatra aren't enough to keep people in love. Sometimes marriages end up like the ones we see on sitcoms, but when there's no laugh track, it's not very funny. 
Sometimes divorce is the answer. Uh? Medieval Germans thought this too, and something they practiced was divorce by combat. Basically, the man goes into a hole with his arm tied behind his back, and the woman is free to move around with a sack of rocks. These proceedings are strange, as I'm sure no husband or wife married today would ever get so frustrated with one another that they would want to hit one another on the head with rocks. Oh, the blessings of being married. Number 5. Domestic Disturbance William the Conqueror was one down bad dude. The illegitimate ruler to the throne left a bad taste in some people's mouths, and was just as ruthless in silencing those rebellions that were always uprising against him as he was with the famous battles he was a part of, like the Battle of Hastings. But what I think he should be remembered by is the way he asked Matilda to marry him, or rather the extreme measures he took when she refused his advances because he was an illegitimate leader. William dragged Matilda by the hair out into the middle of the street and beat her until she agreed to marry him. I don't have to tell you how messed up that is, and I sure hope I don't. Number 4. Nero Sauna The Romans were kind of a big deal, especially if you're into history. Large city, culture, and some other structures are still around today. That's kind of cool. But while the city of Rome may have been the best city on earth at the time, Romans themselves could use a little work. Meet Emperor Nero, the vicious leader of Rome who became emperor through ill-gotten gains. However, in what may have been one of the first acts of flexing the male patriarchy, the divorce or forced separation of his wife Claudia Octavia comes to mind. It was a rocky marriage from the start. There was a general dislike from the very beginning, but when Nero remarried, as emperors did, he had Octavia banished to an island, where shortly after she would be suffocated in a hot vapor bath. Her demise was sad for most Romans. Oh yeah, and they tried to make it look like she did herself in. That's messed up, man. Number 3. Pedestal I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal sometimes. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous. A promising athlete really enjoys collecting stamps. You go, little rock star, collect those presidential stamps. However, Emperor Caligula of Rome had some other ideas. He would literally put his wife, who he claimed to love, up on a pedestal stark naked and let his friends in the military gawk and glare at her. He would also say to her that he could end her life whenever he wanted and put a knife against her for no reason. Weird flex, but okay. This guy was awful to everyone as he tormented and unalive so many people. Well, you sure wouldn't want to see his face everywhere as he liked to do just that. Built statues of himself everywhere because after losing your family to his tyranny and looking at his wife, you need to know who's responsible for all this. That's messed up. Number 2. Doozong 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 That wouldn't really be a great fraternity name, would it? Well, the Emperor of Doozong of China would think differently, as when he was in charge, that's pretty much what the royal court looked like. Enough drinking to keep AA in meetings for 100 years, and enough ladies of the evening to... Well, I don't have a joke for this one, but there were a lot of them, trust me. Having massive parties like that and enjoying the company of other women is not how you respect your wife. To make matters worse, it seemed that too much partying may have been a bad thing. Who would have thought? As what he made up for in a fun weekend, he lacked in governing, as the Mongols were at his front door, or gate rather. Eventually, his empire would burn to the ground. All thanks to Al. Alcohol. And many women who laid down for their lives, literally. Number 1. Side Piece Look, I enjoy the company of a woman just as much as the next king sits on his throne. But in my opinion, once you find a wife, it's time to settle down, relax, no more crazy parties like Duzong. This is another generalization, but every king did this. Every king in the past has had mistresses, as if that is a totally okay thing to do to your wife and oftentimes the queen of your kingdom. I'm a reasonable guy, so maybe I can see having your side piece waiting in the wings to be stage center, but it's never one, is it? It's always multiple. Ladies of the past, all I can say is make sure you give birth to a boy and watch your back. They're coming for you. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. 
As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9. Nero Steam We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't he can't have like 40 wives. Wait, that's we gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's theatrics are important. Remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that for shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry. No, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss, so much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather... Uh, well, mistreatment of women. YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was going to make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you're going to let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. Gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. 
When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things, someone to go through life with, companionship, love, and if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. I love me some baked goods. Mm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just, God, that didn't seem right, you know? It just let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah, Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, th this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope is pretty sick, not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's the king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple bad things he said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he is telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know.